Hello, welcome for a Cafe Realist. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, I threw a call in the Gauntlet Slack and uh, he was uh, very keen on joining me. Sorry, I didn't ask for your pronouns beforehand. Uh, that's he? Oh, uh, he him. He him. All right. Uh, well, go ahead, introduce yourself to, to the viewers. Um, I'm Michael Matthews. I have a, a, had a, a YouTube channel called Confessions of an Improv GM, which I need to get back to, that is about taking improvisational techniques, and particularly from long form, and how those pair up, I think, incredibly well with role-playing games. Um, I also run and sort of post a bunch of, uh, a, a bunch of stuff uh, on that channel of games I've been running as well. And I do, occasionally when my schedule allows it, uh, I do stuff on the gauntlet, but my schedule tends to get busy because I'm also a director. I do a lot of um, uh, theater as well as stand-up comedy and done improv before the place that we performed got shut down so or got sold. Well, we get we had some beginnings of very interesting conversation when I, I cut us short because I said we need this on the stream rather than in all private talks. Uh, I got two ice-breaking questions. My first one is, what is your routine like uh, at that moment? At uh, the moment, uh, at the moment, I'm a little anti-routine because simply because uh, I'm a high school teacher, and we had had at the end of or middle of March, we st because of the quarantine and stay at home, we stopped teaching in person, so it went um, uh, to remote learning. And what we would do then is I would be doing a lot of stuff like checking things, sending stuff out, but the kids' grades couldn't go down, so they weren't doing a whole lot just the ones I was just the ones who needed to, to pass and for me to graduate because I have a whole bunch of seniors um, I ended up at that point actually running a bunch of um, RPGs um, I had some friends who also were in the same boat so we started doing like a twice a week thing and then I started doing some more stuff on the gauntlet and it got to the point where I was running something almost every day Wow! and I actually I, I backed off from that um, uh, because there was a point where I'm realizing there's other things I wanted to do that I just weren't, wasn't sort of getting to. Um, so I backed off um, doing less of that. I've got a, uh, a weekly game. I had the one that we put together for the Mondays and Thursdays, went to just Mondays and that just ended because we've got school and such coming back up. So here in about a week, I have to start getting ready for classes again. So right now it's that sort of gray time where um, uh, I'm trying to get more writing done for uh, play reading I have coming up in about a month. Uh, but then beyond that, I've been not not a lot of routine right now. And so sometimes the days go kind of quick. Uh, if I don't have a game or something on that day, um, uh, it's kind of easy to lose them a little bit. But I'm about to get real busy again because I have to restructure um, basically an entire semester of classes to do it in half the time. Wow. It's uh, it's very impressive, the the amount of work and the, the flexibility shown by uh, by teachers uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and across the world, I'm very my my mother uh, is a retired math teacher, and I, I just cannot imagine how it would have been for her to to reconvert the your way of teaching through uh, doing doing it online. Yeah, we're gonna be going with a hybrid model. Um, this at least at least right now, like one like one day no students, they're all remote. And we have to have stuff for them, and then half the students for two days a week, the other half for the other two, but only till about noon. Um, I actually think some good things will come out of it, uh, partly because it gives us more time to collaborate, to work, to get ready. So instead of like having, you know, classes until three o'clock and then me going straight to a rehearsal with the kids and then leaving at 5.30 to either go to another rehearsal, get prepared for stand up, or, you know, come home and try to get grading or, or other stuff done, that can actually be part of this, the day, which I think will be nice. And so I think will be actually helpful for the kids. So the subject oh. you teach is, is, is performance, writing, or is it completely unrelated? I, I teach theater and English. Um, I have seniors. I'm the only one right now that teaches uh, senior English. I also have creative writing, theater arts, acting one, and we've actually switched second semester of English 4. I'll be teaching a graphic novels course and a social justice novels course uh, second semester. Wow, I really miss uh, I really miss the theater. I had a, a very very short stint thanks to a uh, French teacher. So French teacher for English listeners, he was not teaching me French foreign language. It's like your English teacher. It was my French teacher, and uh, he was the only one bothering to give us a little bit of philosophy. And on the side, he had a 
theater troupe uh, for so we were at level of uh, what is it called before you go to the university up to 18 is that called high school uh, in English high school that's what that's what I teach I, I teach I have mostly 17 and 18 year olds but I, I go from 15 to 18 it's very formative I told theater uh, at that age you you build up you need to build up confidence and ways to interact with other people and uh, that's that's something I would recommend to uh, any teenager uh, to engage into. So yeah, nice. The, sometimes the nice thing is since they're they're learning it, they don't know what's supposed to be terrifying. Um, we did uh, we every about four years I do a Commedia dell'arte, which is it's an oh, improvised play. Like there's yeah, stock that. character types. <laughs> yeah, like these stock character types, and then I then we go through and they they have like an outline for what's happening in the scenes, and we just create it. And when we had a we got adjudicated for a theater festival and the one of the professors from isu came out and they're watching it afterwards she had like one of my students just goes how do we stack up and they're like what what do you mean i mean to other schools comedia she just goes honey nobody does comedia del art in high school like i've never seen this done in high school before they look at me i'm like i there are people i know who would be terrified to do this i didn't tell you it was scary because i don't think it is and i knew i could i could help you do it I love that form of comedia del arte. It's so it, it's fascinating how the uh, you communicate through gestures, the the sides of improv. Uh, it's a form which was developed by a troupe moving into a country with different language. So it it's very visual. It can be very visual, and uh, I think it. I had had the chance to see uh, what would be the English title. Uh, Harlequin, uh, Servant of Two Masters by uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. a Commedia dell'arte troupe from, uh, I think it was Milan and I mean it was truly mind-blowing the performance and the, the performer doing Harlequin, so for people not aware I don't know if that's the way you do it but uh, traditionally they wear masks so you don't see their facial features at all uh, so in terms of expression, that's already very different than one new picture. When you picture, I don't know, a Benedict Cumberbatch or your movie theater where you 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 engage a lot with your face. Uh, but at the end of the play, that performer removed the mask, and it was an old man, uh, gray hair, and the, but the performance was very dynamic, moving, jumping around. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, was really cool that that was a year also we played a Dariofo uh, about uh, Christoph Co Christopher Columbus actually uh, yeah good things <laughs> good memories so uh, did you pick up any new skills interest or hobby uh, lately um not I've I've gotten back to I mean there, there's writing is something I do enjoy doing um, but it's very easy to not do. Um, <laughs> That's one of the things that I've, I've gotten back to, and I, I finally just got a hold of a bunch of friends of mine who are actors right now scattered like all over the country, um, and to do an online play reading, so I gave myself a deadline. I'm like, okay, by the f we're going to have an informal reading on the 15th of August, and at the end of August, we're going to do a online meeting or online reading that people can come and watch. Of, Here's this play script that I've, I've done a couple drafts of, but I went through and had to like, make a whole bunch of changes. So I've gotten a little bit back into writing, but beyond that, um, nothing terribly new. You managed to pick up anything new during all this? Uh, well, at the very beginning of the, the lockdown, I I went quite a bit uh, into... You, you were saying on the gauntlet, like you had a, a rush of gauntlet activity doing uh, once per, per day. I had kind of that with TikTok. And mm -hmm. uh, I cannot resist bringing it up because... Uh, I don't know if you ever check the the comedy skits you find on TikTok, but looking at especially people in the role playing scene, people into Dungeons and Dragons, who re reenact scenes of critical role, I thought it was quite fascinating in terms of performance and acting because it's it's a very special, very highly expressive way of performing, and some some cosplayers there they really pull it off. I find. I have a, actually a girl in my impro or in my uh, my burlesque troupe um, discovered critical role because uh, her boyfriend had actually played a game or two with me um, online. Well, not not a, I haven't actually done D and D in forever, um, 
but she had had an interest in doing something with, with role playing games, and we had tried to as a group because we had done a nerd, a nerd lesque uh, show, and that was about a year ago. And we sort of talked about, hey, let's let's just get the troop together, I'll run a game. And when we started talking about that, she's got heavy into Critical Role. I don't know if she's actually played a game yet, but she got the book, she got all that kind of stuff. But she was like, yeah, can we can we do actual Dungeons and Dragons? I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just not <laughs> one that I. I it's the loop for D and I liked when I was younger, but it was never our main game. Even as a kid, like it's what I started with. Um, I was given some stuff before the Red Box came out, but we got Marvel Superheroes became probably the one we came back to most. We played everything, and when I kind of got back into role playing games, I look back, I'm like, I D and D just doesn't do what I want in an RPG. Um, it- I, I don't like the loop of it anymore, so. Like I had to say, yeah, she, she's done a whole bunch of TikToks doing that stuff, and it's funny because I don't know if she's played yet, but she's she's chopping at the bit. It's fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 interesting this ecosystem of D and D, and when you go on TikTok, it, and I, I've been playing with some TikTokers recently with D and D, and it's it's really weird, and something I've noticed some with in one club here, uh, where it's a lot of younger players who are fans of streamings and Critical Role. They sort of play the tabletop despite of Dungeons and Dragons, but they're still very attached to it. It's it's really hard, and sometimes they, they really uh, when you suggest the idea of playing something else, play something maybe which is more supportive of what they seem to be aiming for. Uh, there's a big of resistance, like you trying to pull them away from a community. I think the yeah, the community is stronger and bigger than than the game itself. It's a it's a nut situation. Yeah, I and there's times where I, it gets frustrating because you'll have people say like, "Oh, you can do anything in D and D," and it's like, I, I remember that in the '90s when Vampire first came out. Like, I played a ton of stuff, but that still felt like this huge burst of fresh air. But I had a group that became 13 people that I was running for. And so, like, we did the politics stuff that was a part of it because that you kind of have to oh, with the, with a group that big. But what we discovered was we would get out of sessions and be like, oh, we didn't even touch dice for the last couple sessions. And we thought that was awesome. But then as, as now I look back at it, I'm like, oh, that's because Vampire's system does nothing to help the fiction. Like, the, the, the system doesn't support the politics and the backstabbing and all that kind of stuff. And the human, humanity system's there, but... It, it doesn't get interacted with as much. Um, now I prefer games that actually support the fiction that they're doing. Um, I mean, I've got the I've got a, the fantasy tavern game I've got coming up, which which I've run before, and I've got it'll be an AP uh, being streamed probably starting in a month or two. But it is when I explained it to one of my one of my players in a different game, I'm like, okay, it is it's a fantasy tavern, and there is it's got like the entrance to the world's largest dungeon in the tavern. But we don't care about the adventurers. We're not playing the adventurers. The characters are going to be like the staff, the people who work there. It's going to be about their love lives. It's going to be about rivalries. It's going to be about personal problems. It's not going to be about going into that dungeon. And I had one, he just couldn't wrap his head around it. And the system I'm using, uh, Cortex Prime, the, the set up like Smallville, um, is all about relationships. It's all about, like, like we, we have a, the current game I'm running it with there was an amazing conflict that happened with two characters, a brother and a sister. And the the sister was dating this guy who was just awful, just awful. Like the kind of person that they all hate, to, they love to hate, because um, he's just the worst. And she was like, I don't know if to break up with him. And so they had this whole mechanical conflict while role playing about him grabbing her phone and like taking it and like basically using it to kind of send a text to this guy. And like they're rolling back and forth is, She's like, like, I try to grab it from him. He does the thing, and like he, they put stress on each other, and that stress becomes XP because it's a game that says, if these two players are going, if the characters are going head to head, if your character and my character are having an, like an emotional um, conflict, one, I can't ever make you do something. I can just give you stress, and I can kind of knock you out of the scene mechanically. But the thing is, if you put stress on me, that becomes experience points for me later, and also puts me in a place where I need to have a scene with another player to get rid of that stress. So it creates more drama. It creates bonds between other characters and it also allows you to grow. So it's a game about your character growth. And it, it's, it, it makes it mechanically interesting. Whereas in a lot of D and D, if you're doing role-playing stuff, if that becomes when you're not playing the game. 
Yeah, it reminds me a bit of uh, my short experience with A Song and Ice and Fire. Uh, at, I think it's Green Ronin. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a game I really thought was fascinating. Uh, it's a bit uh, behind in my memory, but it was like you take D&D or Pathfinder and their main mechanic is to resolve and make interesting uh, physical uh, encounters, conflicts. And uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, and I think it's it's quite uh, appropriate for Game of Thrones, the the mechanics we, which were crunchy were the one for intrigue, which could be a single interaction between two characters or something a bit longer term uh, project. But you really had stuff like different stances that you would uh, adopt, uh, what would be the starting point in terms of or defensive or aggressive you are in those, those things and the, these would have impacts what you're trying to achieve as part of the scene what you're trying to achieve almost each round like oh okay my big deal is to try to get information from that person but I'm gonna start with buttering up this person making so that they appreciate me a bit more it, it's a, it was a bit of a lot but afterwards for a while when I was playing even other games I would try to to use that as a framework to m make richer what I was trying to do in my roleplay mm -hmm. that okay what am I actually re rather than say okay I'm lying to that person say, yeah but I'm lying for what I'm lying for to see to charm I'm lying to have them on the you know make make the wrong make them release an information without noticing it uh, do I want to change their emotional state? All these sort of things uh, were, were in there. That's what I love about the, those good social systems like that. I mean, the, what you're what you're describing it is just how if you're an actor, you're taught to come in there. Okay, what is what is my what's my tactic? Like, what what is my objective? What do I want? How am I going about getting it in this line? And it becomes instead of just spouting off the first thing, it's like okay, I want. I want to intimidate you into doing this thing for me. Well, that doesn't work. Right now, um, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to soft pedal it. You're doing these various things to to change it up so you don't just end up kind of in that internet argument of the same. You're approaching it the same way again and again and again and again. And I, I think yeah, that kind of thing. The way you're talking about what how, what am I trying to do? It's easy to just say something and not think about that. And I think it's more interesting when you do. Which is cool. Something we were kind of discussing before we started. Uh, wh wh where I am right now with role playing games is that I'm t I'm still trying to find where uh, where I sit when I where I enjoy the most uh, the experience. And so I've been playing a lot of Gauntlet games recently, and you know it's a specific community with. You know, different communities, they got different tendencies. We, I, I know different role-playing game clubs here in London. Uh, they, they've got different flavor and character. And Gauntlet is very oriented to PBTA and things where you, you share the storytelling. And what I thought was fascinating is that, uh, and as I always say, it's not a question of judgment of the quality. It's just a question of taste. But mm -hmm. I, I find it... I really like the story we tell. I'm not ex as excited. I, I, I still think I'm, I prefer when someone comes up with a story and tells it. And as a player, I discover that, that story rather than create that story with the, that person. It depends on the, the framework of the thing. Like recently, I play, I play Passion de la Passionesse, where you play telenovelas. And then it was very appropriate for me to, to come up with the story with everyone and make my scene and, and build up that episode of the telenovelas together. But if I play something like uh, urban fantasy, contemporary occult, because, and it's because of my, my background, it annoys me a bit. Uh, it frustrates me because I, I want to find out who's the big villain. And if I'm contributing to making up who's the main villain it's not the same pleasure i don't i don't have this feeling of discovery i'm i'm a creator i'm a designer and some tables when i show up i don't want to be a designer and something i said several times on the show i'm an architect i do a lot of design by committee and uh, and yeah a good design by committee would remind me of 
the best projects I worked on a job on a job, a worst role playing co experience of designing together something sharing the storytelling will remind me of when I was a student and there was no hierarchy and no organization and it was sort of everybody's <laughs> ego ego uh, coming in in the way. But now I'm really like, although I enjoyed those games with the gauntlet, I really find it. I cannot manage to forget myself in the role, even for a few seconds, because very fast, boom, there's a move and you need to come up with something. Yesterday night, something happened to my character. He was in a room and I make up a, a lovely little scene where the room exploded and the other players were outside. So this bed, big massive bed land in front of them with my character lying on it. Uh, I'm not the character anymore when I do that. I'm the writer of that scene and I'm I'm not first person anymore. I'm not in the emotion of the character. I'm into I'm I'm that person telling a comic book artist to draw what what I want to see drawn in, in a strip. Yeah, I it's one of those things where I, I I have seen this before because I do like a lot of PBTA games and such, but when I do those like so I'm I'm almost always a GM. Uh, mostly because often as a player, I mean, I've done improv since 1994. I've done long form since 1998. Um, a lot of times as a player, it feels like a less interesting um, improv. And I'd almost rather be doing something with kind of a group of friends. The stuff I like about it partly comes out of the GM side. And while I'll do things like, I mean, I, I love doing things like, okay, um, like you see a guy across the room just giving you the absolute stink eye. What did you do to piss this guy off? Or something along, along those lines, where I'll get that those information. But I, I tend to like set up uh, situations, and then the players kind of let me know what they by by what their characters do. Here's what we find interesting, and it's it's collaborative in the respect that the, where they want to go is where things happen. But it's also not like the narrative control is not handled handed over this, to the same degree I sometimes see. Like someone come in and then just start like narrating for other characters, doing all this other stuff, and in parts where they're ignoring things that have happened before, where they are throwing out pacing, like, all the way. Um, that stuff frustrates me because as an improviser, pacing is hugely important to me because uh, we do we do long form. It was, we would do like a, a half hour show that was semi short form. It was it was like faster and punchier. Then a fia the role playing game Fiasco actually became our main long form, where we would then do a 45 minute to an hour long like fiasco we get that stuff during the short form to create like a, a block of people and their different relationships and needs and, and an object and then we would go and do this this long form and when we did it with some people who weren't used to an hour long i would have to kind of like make sure that they weren't killing it because it's like no we have to go for an hour like if you if you destroy this part of the of the storyline in the first scene like you're doing like a short form game we don't have anywhere to go so I've, I've had to break some habits of people who are used to short form, throw, throw things so hard it doesn't matter because you're only going to be this thing for a couple minutes. And I've seen that sort of a thing in a game where it's just like they don't know how to listen as actively because, I mean, with improv, it's a huge thing. You have to get, you, have, you really have to know exactly what's going on. Um, you have to listen incredibly actively where suddenly things get thrown out. They don't know how to pace it. I find myself getting super frustrated with that. And then also the, sometimes the like you said, when it, it doesn't, actor stance or writer stance for me doesn't matter because I, I can pop in and out. Um, and again, that comes because of the improv experience. But then I was asked one time as a player, how do you defeat this big bad thing? I'm like, I didn't, I didn't want to answer it. I'm like, I don't know, you tell me. I'm like, I'm doing the thing. I'm like, I, I, what am I supposed to, oh yeah, I, I just, I hit this button and it's, it's gone. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not, that's, I, that's not the thing. I just didn't want to do that and I was already the pacing was bad and there was other stuff that was frustrating me. Um, but yeah, that, that completely took me out. Cause I, th I think I've, I've enjoyed GMless games with narrative control stuff, but that's usually the stuff where you either have people who are really, really on top of that. They all know kind of how to share it or the game itself has enough structure yeah. that people aren't sort of left out. I found which road to Lannis farm is so poorly structured that it's very easy, particularly for the witch, which I was, to not be involved in almost any of the game because other people aren't thinking, oh, hey, we have one person who can't make these same decisions. Their character should be involved too. And instead they have scenes that don't matter much. They, they, nothing is really happening. 
in them and it, it gets yeah it gets frustrating that's where someone to help drive it i find can help keep it interesting for everybody yeah the one of the game i enjoyed the most gm less and you, you could even argue that it's not gm less it's it, there, there's a difference between gm less and multiple gm games uh it's called uh becoming i think it's becoming hero's journey or something like that and you got one player who plays a hero, and then you got three players who play uh, the faith. So the you know the mythical figures who weave the fabric of destiny, and mm -hmm. the, each faith has got a specific role to do within an, an act, and you got a specific number of acts, so you know where g you're going. So the the game is very strict with what it does, and Everybody's got a role, and yeah, the faith they take turns. But one faith does the setup, one faith tells what's the challenge, and one faith tells what's going to be at stake, what's going to be the the end result of it, and then the hero takes the decision. But since it's so structuring, it you know it supports players who it's not even just a res uh, a question of of skill set, but if you are uh, Sometimes you're just not inspired, or it it just doesn't land, and because you're not trained in that, you don't really know why. Like for the Gauntlet community open days, I played Hearts of Wulin, and again, Passion de la Passiones, Passion de la Passiones, everything landed perfectly and was like tied mm -hmm. with a little bow at the end. It was uh, amazing. Hearts of Wulin, we came up with interesting concept and ideas, and I it was fun, but it didn't really didn't really work for some reason the, the the pieces were too loose or we were trying to duct tape them together was that, was or they were shot? yeah it wasn't was one, one shot, shot? so it's I, also oh, I, special. I think like a lot of PBTA games it's not a it's not a good one shot game um i i think i think that one i mean hearts of Lynn, i think really has to breathe and have its time to develop uh, a one shot particularly if you're not handed a character at the beginning oh well, we create the character we come up with all this we, we spend half the time coming up with this stuff that leaves you with like two hours to play and yeah it just, just doesn't give you the time to explore it yeah that's one thing also with quite a few games <laughs> i really don't like session zero not not what i dislike is not it's not the the safety practice and agreeing on what is going on a bit but i, I really dislike spending a one session of several hours coming up with a character and a concept together I just there. I'm like, I want to play. <laughs> I would prefer to exchange a few emails about that beforehand, and then we show up, and we play, and we can find stuff up uh, along the way. But I I'm really annoyed when I leave a session. It was yeah, okay. So yeah, we had we had a design committee, and again, uh, it's. I'm not saying I understand that people have fun doing that, uh, but I don't so much because it reminds me of my work. <laughs> 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 like I don't mind. <coughs> uh, I don't mind them. It's I, I think sometimes when you're only doing three or four set when when it's like the gauntlet kind of thing where you're only getting together for a couple sessions, it does become frustrating when m almost an entire session just becomes that. Um, I do kind of, I do kind of prefer if you're able to sort of jump in relatively quickly. Um, occasionally, I've done some games like when I did Spectaculars. Um, that one, I mean, that one has a really cool way of the group kind of coming up with the, the city, the world, all that kind of stuff. And But we still had some time to get into the actual game in the same one. But then the rest of them, we were able to hop in pretty pretty instantly. But for me, the problem sometimes with the open table, besides that for some people, it kind of becomes, they sign up, but if they're going to show up is a little iffy, um, became like we created this cool world, but as people came in and out of it, all that stuff got lost. Because with the new people coming in, or a new person would come in, now they've got to make the character, which, if you know the game, doesn't take very long. But if you're just, like, if you were to create a new character in Spectaculars and you played for even two sessions, it would take three and a half minutes. You'd be like, oh, I'm going to take this, uh, da, 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 this, da, 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 that, done. Um, but with someone who's not used to it, like, it, it takes them a bunch of time. So we would spend the first 20, 30, 40 minutes, probably 40, 40 minutes or so, making the characters that then we could start which i found very frustrating so does uh does uh, uh confessions of an improv game master give uh, pointers so if we play with you you're less frustrated by us 
Um, the, other, the frustration stuff, um, the, the stuff I've done in uh, Confessions of an Improv GM, it's taking, in particular, long form um, improv uh, techniques and bringing them over to uh, role playing games. Because I think it's a better fit. Because, like, one of the big problems I'll see, and this drives me nuts, and I've, I've, got, I've had some players get a little offended because I'm like, like, oh, I wrote an eight page backstory. I'm like, I'm not reading that. And there's a couple reasons. I mean, and some one, the the one that's selfish is most people are shitty writers, and I don't want to write. I, I don't want to read eight pages of bad prose, and it's it's not the person's fault. And just most people aren't good writers. And the other problem is they take questionnaires from uh, from what what actors use, like all this stuff to give little extra bits of information about it, or they take the the same things that like authors will use to write up stuff beforehand. But in both of those cases, when you show up as, a, as an actor or if you're writing, if you need to throw something out, oh, that idea I had for this character, it's not going to work. That happens as, as both a director and an actor all the time. I had someone come in where they had a very different I no, Normally, we'll meet each other in the middle because I, I want to see what my actors bring to me and then I'll, I'll adjust what I've got. But occasionally, it's had to be like, yeah, the thing that you're thinking is just not going to work. And here are the reasons why. And an actor will throw it out, but a, a player often goes, yeah, but that's my backstory. Yeah, but this thing won't make. Yeah, but th that's important. My character, it's my backstory. I'm like, you haven't played a minute in the game when you did that. You didn't know what the other characters were going to be. You don't know how your character has to adjust. And some of the stuff in there is, in particular, how as both a player and a GM, you take those things where it's like you, you have a general idea. You don't sketch in every single detail because in an improv you don't have time. But you remember what you've done and you add you add new things and. Um, uh, you create on the spot, not by making these big giant like I've got to do twelve pages or something. You make one decision. Yeah, you um, and like the the decision might become hopefully the foreshadowing of something which uh, evolves later. I mean, character wise, like one of the things that I I do as a GM and I tell players to do as a player to figure out your character. Just choose an emotional state before you say something. So if you come up to like a guard and I might decide um, this guard is uh, incredibly sad and you might come in like with something happy and then suddenly it's like this guy's really, well, why is he really sad? Is it what the players said did that did that hit something that's going on in their life? Is he going through a divorce? Um, is like all like it could be any number of things, but it can create super interesting interactions and characters because you then justify and it's your PC and just go, whatever this person is going to say next is going to piss me off. And then they say something and then you're like, now why would that make me angry? And then you fill in that, that question in your head and suddenly your character is growing in interesting ways. Uh, particularly if you're, if you're like towards the beginning of playing. Um, and those are a couple of the techniques and other ones are how to lay out uh, threads and how to follow them uh, as a GM. But yeah, a lot of it's going, how do I listen to the people around me? How do I take what they did and build off it? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the whole yes and that goes around role playing. Eight. Yeah, I'm, it, oh, I get very angry with it because people use it wrong. Um, <laughs> and the thing is, they, they get the they get the wrong part that's important. In improv, the yes and is you're in front of an audience, you don't have time. It's not literally saying yes. You're allowed to shut down ideas in certain respects, but you're in an RPG. You can actually stop and go, yeah, that's not going to work, and here's why. Is not simply say yes, but the most important part of that is the and. It's the add something on top of it. Um, because in an RPG, sometimes what you need to do is go, stop. Yeah, that, we can't agree to that thing you're doing, and here's why. Um, I mean, the, the X card explicitly should make that happen. But I've, I know some people who feel like, well, with yes and means you never say no. It's like, mm -mm, I'll say no. <laughs> Like just sometimes that thing you said will not work. It just simply, if you like, you look at what you just said. There's no possible way that'll work. There's a lot of, you know, taglines like that which are really misleading. I find another one is, you can do and be anything you want in a role-playing game, and it's no, <laughs> no, because to be honest, I would hate that. I would really hate showing up in a game and I'm told you can be anything and you can be anywhere like no 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 i sign up for you know i i look the list of games on offer 
-hmm. I picked a game because oh, I'd like to to be in that world and do this sort of things. I want to be this thing this this Saturday, Saturday evening. I'm not there to come up with nothing. I, I mean, again, maybe it's a professional thing also because as an architect, I always say I like to work with constraints. Uh, little story, my as wife. An yeah, my wife okay. once asked me, "Oh, could you dream? Could you draw my dream house for me?" And I was like, "No, no, I cannot do that because you're gonna hand me a, a blank piece of paper." And I'm like, "So what? Where, where's the sun? Where's the, is there a slope? Where do people arrive there? I need all this stuff mm -hmm. to do something." Of course, she could pick a. Eventually, she could pick a piece of land somewhere, show it to me, and tell me well, what it would be like. To build a house there, I was like, okay, what's your budget? Well, what, how long are you going to yeah. live, live there? And uh, do you need a car or not? Or cycles? I, I need I need all this stuff to, to come up with. And and I find it very weird also this this notion of freedom as the the big thing for art. Like our oh, freedom, artists they they need their freedom. And as as soon as you put some, you start talking about commercial, financial. Uh, it's it's also very French, you know. This author thing is still very very strong in France. It's not it's not a craft. It's not something people come up with together. And there's a l number of things. Is this author artist thing who come up with an invention out of of nowhere? And to come back in role playing game, I'm a big I'm all for pre generated characters personally uh, with. Just those elements, not eight pages, but one page. They say, okay, that's their deal. And to give some idea, but characters don't have to be married to it. And there are here are the couple things which tie those characters to a story that we're going to tell together. And I find it fascinating how people are like, oh, oh no, no, I'm married to this character. It's limiting me. And myself, I'm like, no, there's so many blanks. As you said, yeah, what's well. the mood of that character? What what does the character looks like? What's the, I mean, generally or at least when I write them, I don't have a long list detailing all the the dress or they behave, their manners and so on. And there's so much to flesh out on that skeleton. I need the skeleton mm -hmm. <laughs> to work on something. I, and I think. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. It's I think the people who are like, oh, you need total freedom, or or I, I if I've got a box or something, I can like, a, a place I'm in. There's nothing I can do. I'm like, you're probably not an artist. You're probably not someone who creates something, because as a director, as 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 an actor, as anything, like when you have like when you have got constraints, you become creative. Um, I think Neil Gaiman said a thing. He goes, if you want to hire me to write a short story, awesome. I will probably never get it written. If you tell me we're do if you if you goes if you tell me we're doing a uh, uh, anthology about werewolves you will have a werewolf story. He goes if you just tell me write a story I will mean well. He goes like, but, but like good luck. Um, but if you hire me for like th this is this is a a thing about preschoolers who discover a vampire. He'd be like great I got I'll I'll, I'll bang that out. And it's I'll see people who feel like um, I know I know I know someone who wanted to do an all dwarf game. That took place in like a dwarven city, and there were and out, out of those five characters, I think there was one dwarf. And he's like, well, I mean, that's creative. And there's this whole thing of like, well, like when someone has to be like this special snowflake character that like it's the only one in the world. It's a, it's a a bugbear ranger druid who does blah blah blah. It's like that's that is as far away from creative as you can be. Like. Play, if you play a regular human fighter if we're using D&D &D as the sort of basic and make that character interesting and when they say like well I can't I'm like all you know in the real world is actual people and you know what some of those actual people are interesting and not just because of what they do it's a lack of imagination to believe that if you don't have total freedom you can't be creative because I am much more creative as a director because I the, the place I tend to work is a small black box theater which means a lot of things that I could do on a much bigger stage, I just can't do there. But I can get some amazing results because I come in and I have these constraints. Or sometimes I have something that I look at and I'm like, yeah, this isn't working, this idea I had. So how do we make it work using the talent that we've got, using the space that we've got, using the, this particular script? And the creativity comes out of the constraints. Um, the, more, the more you have to, the, the more resources you have to throw at something, the less creative you can be. Yeah, that's my frustration. I, I 
that's my frustration with so many directors and writers who, who I always find they, they do something amazing early in their, their career. It's not that the, the talent is not there anymore, but they, they're just surrounded by yes men or they, they got the resources to mm -hmm. do whatever they want and, and the thing so, sort of collapses uh, on, on itself. I mean, people like, uh, sorry if they're, they're fans here, but uh, like later movie by Scorsese I, I just find it really not interesting or even the Tarantino and all these people it's much more interesting when they, they had limited budget and all sorts of things and I think it's also the problem with <coughs> CGI I, I, I don't think CGI is a bad thing in itself but people people don't have to think as hard as they can to about what they can or, or, or cannot do uh, or in a movie. I mean, there's so many, you know, it's all the, it's the anecdotes, but there's so many big movies, big production, that my favorite moments in there when you, you start of reading the story of their production came up because they encountered a difficulty or a hard choice. And then it's uh, Harrison Ford who's sick on the shoot of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and cannot do oh, yeah. the, the fighting choreography. It's George Lucas who burns his budget trying to have a a scene with snow tanks in Empire Strikes Back and then, oh, we need to come up with something else and then you got the Battle of Hoth with those uh, mm -hmm. at, at uh, quadri quadripods. And yeah, and then you see, oh, you got CGI, you can do whatever you want. Oh, we got to see this, this, and uh, the, the fighting scene is going to be uh, 30 minutes long instead of 15. It's like, oh. <laughs> well, that, that was what impressed me about, like, I mean, it's one of the things I noticed the difference between like the Marvel movies and some of the other ones because like the Marvel movies overall are they're fun, they're they're often not great, and they're they're often kind of samey, but they do character stuff. They're well crafted. Like, like, well, they're, so like, the, you yeah. you expect a, a like, level like, of production, and it's quite consistent. It's not the the greatest yeah. thing to say of someone uh, creating a, a piece of art, uh, but yeah, it's consistent. Mm -hmm. But I, I found like if you go back and look at the reactions, it doesn't. The CGI is, is not is never what makes some the people go crazy. It's the character stuff that's been built up. Like the, this, this the CGI. If it's if you're just going here's spectacle. Like I've rarely seen spectacle that has more than once made me go, oh that's cool. Because the second time you see it, it doesn't matter if, if the character and such isn't there. And I think some people think with action films in particular, oh if you just make this fight big and oh look at the CGI fight. It's going to be cool, and often no. I mean, John, the John Wick fights, or Jackie, even the Jackie Chan, as 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 janky as a story in a Jackie Chan movie can be. Because let's be honest, you don't watch a Jackie Chan movie for the for the the character. You don't watch it. You don't watch it for the the storyline. You watch it for that just incredible ballet of 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 fight of combat. But the Jackie Chan there, Jackie um, Chan movie, were, I mean, it's amazing to look how those things were shot, and. You know, it's it's like a ballet. It's not it's not like a CGI fight uh, at the end of yeah. Avengers. Uh, Jackie Chan trying to shoot something with as little cuts as possible. He's working with the environment. He's doing literally the stunt, so he cannot do absolutely whatever he wants. So what he manages yeah. to do, he does, and and that's it's, amazing. It, it's it, you you can go back to his old stuff, and it's still great. It still works because there was never a point where they just like, okay, we're just going to make a spectacle that's CGI. It's like, no, he's going to do this thing that is nuts, but amazing. Yeah, and I, because you couldn't rely on someone else doing it. And I think that helped a lot. I think that that's not something I've heard a lot in the, the discourse, in the podcast and YouTube videos I watch in Tabletop Roping, this idea of uh, curation. Uh, curation... Uh, as the, the game master being a curator and mm -hmm. offers an experience and then the players opt in or not and and then the, the players being respectful of that curation so it, it's a bit with this again topic of freedom uh, I, I want a game master to set borders and say okay you will be able to do this and not do that you, you need to buy in and uh, I think the almost the strict uh, I think that's where I can enjoy the most some PBTA game again going back to Passion de la Passion is, okay it's a telenovela it's a soap opera like the young and the restless it's very clear what's gonna happen and what's not gonna happen 
in that context. So I think a PBTA as trope simulators uh, or genre emulators, I think that's what they're sometimes called, it works the best when the genre is is the most clearly defined and mm -hmm. yeah in your in the head of everyone around the table and you actually build on those things and everyone is very excited to do the the tropey things which you would expect in that type of movie and uh, oh yeah you you managed to pull off the trope very well that was exciting have you found when you when you've been <coughs> in those sort of games um how much has the has the GM when you when you've been in them um, been looking at the players too? Because like, I I like I, I love getting details about things. Um, like tell like like, like uh, Apocalypse World. So tell me tell me what your living quarters is. Like, we, we might have talked as a thing what the whole thing is, but tell me what your living like. Why is that person? Um, how how have they helped you in the past? Or those sort of things where you're given those details. But and while the while the players the things that they're interested in drive it. It's not like a, a thing where it's like, oh, well, um, what kind of a conflict do you want to get into today? It's much more like, um, what are the things you need to take care of right now? Like, like uh, this thing happens. What do you do because that thing happened? Well, it's a wide or, or do, they, do they do they kind of give that all over to you? It's a wide spectrum, and uh, part of my uh, frustration is a strong word, but uh, I find it's a pity that because there's no real conversation about that. It's not something you can really tell from the description of a game. So you need to know the game master to know where you're going. And uh, PBTA game, I played a PBTA game which was run like a, I hate that that word, a traditional game, uh, mm. ludist game, so I, I try to call them. And I was frustrated with it because that evening I went, okay, I'm going to play one star of the week. I want to get more experience playing PBTA games. And then it was run, okay, here's the map of the the building you enter. And I was like, that's not, that doesn't seem appropriate oh, in a PBTA game. Wait, did, 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 did they turn a PBA into a hex crawl? No, no, a hex crawl, but they showed or up. Like, like, well, not, not a hex crawl, but like, like yeah. a dungeon crawl. Not, not a dungeon crawl, but it was it was a, just a building. It was the coroner, uh, so you 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 end up there. But the person pulled out a a plan of the the place with rooms where we haven't we didn't even go there, and uh, and you know it was kind of symptomatic of all the way the the thing was run. It was like using that system, which is designed, I think, to to be played a different way. It was played sort of straight, like like any. It could have been GURPS, it could have been Star Wars DC, it could have been anything. It was more okay. Let's resolve the action, or you did that, or use that. It's not in, so. Except instead of using a skill, you were using a move, and I thought it was very confusing. And at the other end of the spectrum, I played a game and uh, had fun with it. Uh, but I played a game, it was not even PBTA, it was uh, a mod of Cthulhu Dark, uh, run by Alan from The Gauntlet, who is an amazing game master. But his style, or at least the style of this game, was very... Okay, you're gonna ent you need to go into this factory uh, and free the, the, the hostages from that place, and there's probably a vampire in there. Okay, you need to come up with three... Uh, obstacles you're gonna encounter and the players say okay well the, the whole place is fenced up and then oh well I described a big reservoir we needed to come across <coughs> and before that we all even said each player okay what do you want as part of what's gonna happen today in the session to happen so for me I said well I would like my character to go down a zip line at some point and uh, and and it's not bad yeah, or good. Uh, it was enjoyable for an evening, but it's not my style. And my problem is not whether I would say, no, you shouldn't do that, or yes, you should do that, which I hear some people say. It's that we should we should have a language and sort of, you know, it should be discussed that you, when you go in, you know what to expect. And mm -hmm. and this way, I mean, you you almost need a cursor, which, which would not be perfect, but no, like coming away from that, I'm thinking like I would like to run a game using the same system, where the story would be much more curated and it's more resolution, 
and it's more like you say I ask players to come up with details and it's more about their personal experience of the character because at, at the same time it's something I enjoy more uh, I mm -hmm. prefer to write a story myself that rather than write it as other people and as a player I prefer to uncover a story rather than than create it now no, there's a misconception with that uh, and then I'm done with this but coming from uh, the old uh, uh, scary tales of bad game masters and dungeon masters I find that doesn't mean that you are that you are not open or listening to what's going on at the table that you got a plan and you set on it and you, you don't look at your player trying to understand what they feel that you don't mm -hmm co-opt ideas that come up you find interesting that you don't show flexibility that's that's something different but yeah there's a difference between shared storytelling versus highly curated storytelling i would say mm -hmm. and the, uh, the notion of removing agency from players and being um i don't want to be ablaze but i, I cannot find it uh, a word uh deaf to yeah, you know, it doesn't mean that you are you're a dick. You you're, know? Sort of you're, you're not railroading them or ignoring what they want. Yeah, you're, yeah, it can be railroady. Like my the, one of the experience which really changed my view on things was one of the best session of Call of Tulu I had was very railroady. No, but not railroady like we turn you this way, this way. But it was very clear where it was going. There was no real. We wouldn't cover what happened to the spot, but there was no investigation where we could pick up clue and miss a door and get lost. It was yeah. we go there. It was a scouting cl uh, club. Uh, our children had disappeared. We played parents, but because I had, didn't have to care about missing the intrigue or the plot, I was that was really the one session I was f the most into my character. I was, uh, you know, almost like if I was ended the text, no, I was making up the lines and so on, but I was really this uh, divorced father having to look for his disappeared daughter with with a stepfather and, and being really annoyed by that and being working class and, you know, trying to, come up, trying to live into that person's shoes rather than being pulled out and say, and now, what is this mountain like? Have you have you played the alien role playing game? Once, but the conditions were were quite poor. It was in a a large gaming shop. It was very noisy and so on. So, uh, but yeah, that, that could have been like that. I mean, that that's one of those like it's one of the only games where I'm like I I'm not I not only would run a module with it, but excited to. Um, because I mean, we talked earlier about having the pregens like. With, if you're doing Chariots of the Gods or Destroyer of Worlds or the Hadley's Last Day, which are the three that are out so far, and I've created a few others, um, you choose from the characters. But here's your crew. They've got agendas, and the agendas are the things that your characters are sort of trying to do. And the nature of it, because it is designed to be a horror thriller, um, like with Chariots of the Gods, like you wake up uh, out of hypersleep, and things start to go wrong, and it's like, it's literally impossible for you to decide, well, we're going to go off to that planet over there because of what happens in the game. I mean, like you're going to hit some of these specific things, but it's still because it's like horror, I think in particular, the more power that the, the players have to um, create the world, particularly on the fly, the less interesting it tends to be because part of it is going up against the things that you don't, get or understand or the, the the characters are not able to necessarily have a whole lot of control over yeah it's not something so it's the, uh, the uh, it's something i could understand a game where you come together with a horror story but that's not something i would seek because mm -hmm. I, I mean i think if you write together a horror story that's not a scary experience there's no way i, I don't see any way i could write sh contribute to the storytelling say okay so what's behind that door? <laughs> if and and be scared. I mean, this kind of this thing. There's a lot of stress put on storytelling in the discourse about role playing games. And what I hear, I would like to hear more. And arcs of characters and so on. I'm more interested in the emotion of a scene and a moment than mm -hmm. than the story per se. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the overall story is always going to be a part of it because I mean, it, it becomes a, my background of doing hour-long plays, essentially, off the cuff in front of people. Like, those moments and such are all important. I can't help but do the structure, but the structure, I have so much practice in doing it on the fly, in person, in front of an audience, that that structure becomes almost second nature. So I, I concentrate on the scene right now, and then it's like, okay, because of this what would happen next or what's going to cause something else so it, it's it's always in the back of my head but it's not like here's the way things have to go let's dive into this scene and then see what's the next natural place for it to be. that's a common misconception also i i mean i'm uh, i did very little improv but as far as i can tell you, you know mainstream they tend to think improv is this again free form thing while actually you have in the back of your head or your, your skills it can be intuitive, but you, you got those structures, you know, the, the, those frameworks which you f follow and, uh, okay, this happens, then that needs to happen or something in that way. You might not know the specifics of it, but you know that this action should have a reaction at some point. Otherwise, it's just, it's just a bunch of nonsense. And I've, I've seen improv that turns into complete nonsense. Um, and it's teaching, like, a, it's sometimes been my job to teach people, like, here's what you got to do to make something work. Kind of longer form um and from what we're saying before i've seen times where because someone just takes over the narrative and doesn't know how to do it they turn the scene into nonsense <laughs> like one thing i've noticed if a player starts speeding up if they have narrative control and they go faster and faster and faster they're getting so far ahead of their ideas that they're not adding anything together so it just kind of becomes and the next thing and the next thing you look back at it going okay, that, what they just said doesn't make any sense with anything that's happened before. Um, it, it, they've jumped to a really weird spot right now. In, in terms of having a, a mean to structure a form of improvisation, and especially to, to write a genre thing, I, I was wondering, you know, that there's mentions of more and more, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's more of them, I think it's like this just more uh, visible, but more people being in, in the industry, in the movie industry, and uh, to a lesser extent, theater industry, into role-playing games. Uh, not to a lesser extent that there's less of that, but uh, we hear sadly less in the news about theater uh, directors. Mm -hmm. But I, I was wondering, can something... Have you ever considered or did you something like... You play a session of Fiasco, or another role-playing game, uh, which, I don't know, would emulate a noir story, and come up with something uh, with the game which you think oh, actually there's something there I could consolidate into an actual written work or, uh, which would be appropriate to then play. Uh, do, do you actually do that also with improv, improv stuff and then those things become uh, actual plays? Do you, do you mean as far as turning it into something that would be like a like an actual play, like yeah, stream yeah, or podcast? Yeah, or, oh, or, no. or just a, a, I, I a meant, work derivative of a role-playing game? Yeah, well, yeah, no, I was wondering if one could use a, a gamified method, like Fiasco, playing a game as a, a creative output to inspire them stories, which then they consolidate into... Uh, when I said actual play, I didn't mean actual play as... Those it's just a derivative work of like, yeah, a, a, a diff a work in a different medium. In a play, in a pro quotation mark proper theater play or a proper script for for a production. I, I mean, it definitely could. Um, I, I kind of have a thing where I'm I, I become a purist in the fact that because the, the difference between like an improv or a scripted thing or a role playing game, they're, they're all kind of separate artistic stuff. I, I tend to well, I keep separation. Like I mentioned before, my, my old improv troops, our main long form was a fiasco. Now, we wouldn't use it as structured on the, your character has a scene, my character has a scene. There, we, we use improv structure, but we would use the fiasco to create an hour-long play. So we would use that as our, as our base sort of level. Um, as far as like using like improv or something else to create a derivative work, that's one of Second City's big things is they, they do like, they're known for improv, but if you see their their shows, like the traveling shows are a lot of a sketch with some improv in it because they use improv to create the sketches. So that's and how well, you well, workshop I, I, 
yeah, and there's things I like about that, but I, there's also part of me that I just I also love improv as a pure art form. Of course, um, yeah. When it's done well, like like <laughs> improv done poor. Well, I'm trying to figure out what's worse: improv done poorly or sketch done poorly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's like they both can be bad, but I, I, I think there's at least an energy to improv, like really bad improv, where it feels like it could come apart. Like really bad sketch tends to be just kind of boring and not funny. Really bad improv can get to a place where the train wreck on stage just gets train wreckier and train wreckier. So it's not good or fun, but it's but it, it's interesting. <laughs> I remember some play like that uh, was that that is a thing which hurts when with play especially small plays uh plays which I you know there there are movie festival I like to go and people go there and they have fun at the expense of the movie or the performance on screen mm-hmm. I've been sometimes to play which were not going as one wish or or it was not clicking with the audience uh a lot of but you know they 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 are they're harsh but fair audience uh like younger uh students who come with their their teacher because they're kind of forced to uh, i've seen those audience being very generous with plays and I've seen them also being very harsh <laughs> with plays and you're in the middle of there and you you kind of agree that what's on the stage is really really bad but yeah I am um, yeah I got memories of uh, uh, the worst one I, I was alone I saw a a performance by the staff of the State Department the US State Department in Brussels of a, <laughs> a play from uh, oh. what what's his name this m- massive play writer from the US which is most most audience in in France and Belgium are, are really not interested in in him. Uh, I must admit, uh, death of a what, what, salesman and so on. Oh, Arthur, Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller, yeah, huge person in theater. No, not theater is one thing. It's very you know national things. It 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 changes a lot when you cross a a border between Belgium, France, and and the UK. Mm-hmm. And so the. So you had this amateur troupe of uh, uh, the State Department playing an Arthur Miller play uh, with their own culture of theater, which is quite different, and it was it was hilarious in a in a in a very bad way. <laughs> so it's a good memory. <laughs> Arthur Miller is well known for his hilarious plays. Um. <laughs> I mean, th- there was this kind. You know, we were talking about constraints, and uh, what what I miss from plays in Belgium is that usually the the budget they are they are very sort of underproduced compared to here in London. Like if someone enters a room and it's a it's a library uh, in Belgium. The person will say, "I enter the library," or this. Maybe there will be a sign which says "library" or a light projection of some kind. Here in London, you've got a fucking library. <laughs> they, they built a fake library in the place, and the Arthur Miller play by the State Department was like they came from this culture of producing the set, which looks like so being kind of literal with things, but without a budget. So they ended up like a big. Pl- pl- element of the play was a big tree in a garden and the tree represented the hope of the sun coming back from war or something like that but mm-hmm. clearly they didn't have the it was not a theater where you can really fit a tree and they wouldn't have a budget for a tree but they they still brought a plant <laughs> which is a, a very tiny tree and it it was very counterproductive it would have been way better without anything and just people still staring in the distance saying look at that magnificent tree rather than have the tree there especially when the the big conclusion of the thing which you know when you have uses of storytelling structure you're like you know you're like oh my god this tree is gonna be struck by a lightning or something is gonna fall (laughs) it's gonna fall down and someone's gonna push over that plant at some point and yeah that's a place where i burst into laughter and I had to leave the, the room. <laughs> I was told some stories about, and I didn't see these ones, but at U of I, um, which I live in, I live where the University of Illinois is. Um, they, there's two shows they did where they, it, their problem was they overdid something to the point where it became <laughs> hilarious. Like one was a like, cat on a hot tin roof and they made a rainstorm happen with like rain coming down on, on this like tin shack thing and there's all this noise. And the thing was, 
it was so impressive that it stopped the show because the audience <laughs> applauded the tech thing that was that it kind of just it screeched everything to a halt at another time they're doing Macbeth at the end of it when Macbeth is killed he goes behind something and the, the person playing Macbeth like raises his sword lops it down and they had made a head that he could hold up and had like dangling like, uh, like entrails <laughs> underneath it he's like ah and held up this head and the audience and this is like the climax of the play just burst into laughter because now they've got this head that he's holding up there and it becomes funny because it's on stage. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's very it's very tricky. Theater, you need uh, th there's a reason why you need a lot of rehearsals, and you even rehearse <laughs> in front of an audience, and you find out what what's working and uh, mm -hmm. n not not so much. Uh. Ah, yeah. Well, we're we gonna need to bring this to a close. It was a a, a pleasure <laughs> to have you. Uh, uh, did did we miss anything you wanted to plug? We can still talk about something you you wish to uh, plug. I can just say uh, here in in probably in a month or two. Um, we don't have a name for it yet, but an AP is going to be starting using Cortex Prime about the. It's it's essentially is when when I explained it during an Alien game I ran for Gamers Table on on stream recently. He's like, wait a minute. This sounds like fantasy cheers. I'm like, yep. It is a fantasy tavern with a, a the, the entrance to the world's largest dungeon is in that tavern, but it's not about the adventures. It's about like the owner. And so far we've got like, the owner and the cook and this burnt out mage who gives advice to adventurers going through, but it's more about like their lives and love lives and rivalries and, and character stuff. So it, it has the trappings of of like a fantasy thing but it's much more of a workplace drama slash comedy um that should be a lot of fun because we did something like it about a year and a half ago before schedules killed it uh, and it was a ton of fun and some super interesting things uh in a style of, of role playing with the types of role playing stuff that i think a lot of people don't often see because so much of it is is either based in combat or ignoring the system to have the role playing moments where those things are actually mechanized in the system in some really cool ways. Yeah, well, Cortex, which uh, they had a, a big announcement recently, the the Dragon Prince is gonna have a tabletop role playing game uh, mm -hmm. uh, version, which is gonna be with Cortex. So that's quite cool. There's a Smallville game I'd really like to to try at some point. Uh, Michael Ross from the RPG Academy, he's got a a sideshow. I'm plugging him. Uh, it's called Farm to Fable. It's a Smallville mm -hmm. fan cast, uh, so I recommend uh, people to to check out. It's funny this thing. At this point, I I'm still not sure if I actually want the system to be out of my way when I role play, or put its finger in it. I uh, I still need to find a system. I again maybe a Song of Ice and Fire, but to find a system which supports my immersion and my role play. Rather than than break it, you know, we were playing about we were talking about Commedia dell'arte, and I remember what, one thing I, I thought fascinating when I, I read a bit of theory about it was that so they they wear those masks, but they never touch it. They, they they're not supposed to touch it because as soon as they touch it, they can point at it, be very close of it, but they say that as soon as they touch it, it it becomes a mask again. It breaks and, and not their face. the illusion. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, you, you kind of want to make it their face. I think it's one of those things I think a lot of people get, they're reticent to kind of mess with things that have social mechanics. One, because so many of them are done poorly. Um, but with like in Smallville, um, the Cortex Prime one that we're, we're using, it does, I mean, it, it, it slows things down in certain respects, but I found it also heightens things so much that when you get into like that sort of an argument, it, do, it, it that and like Dogs in the Vineyard, I find does the same thing. It one, it turns what's happening much, much more into like what you see in good writing, where the back and forth then becomes with a lot of purpose. Like, like, like you mentioned earlier, oh, am I, why am I, am I doing it this for this reason? As opposed to the back and forth at a, a table when people are just sort of role playing, if you don't know how to escalate, which is something we, that we, we harp on a lot in improv, because a lot of improv scenes will just be the same thing. Um, it creates that escalation, which a lot of people aren't necessarily good at. And so it means that each of those back and forths in a thing where, where you go back down, this is the, this is the value. I'm, this is why I'm doing it. This is who I'm doing it for. 
this is the thing. So you roll, and once, you, once you're used to it, it goes real quick, it's boom, boom, boom. Uh, I put this forward, this. So here's my total, here's my effect die. And you say the thing that your, your character says or does, and then the other person responds. I've, I found it just, it ratchets it up the tension and makes the scene matter more, a little more easily than if it's just that back and forth. But it does cause those breaks to happen. Yeah. For some people, that's a deal breaker. Well, yeah. I, I, again, I guess, I guess what I, I can see how it could work, like if it gives you a pointer at the beginning of your role play, and then at some point of the role play, it's sort of segmented because it's also it's no point of anything, and I think it, it applies for sessions also. Another thing I like about the gauntlet, we take breaks, and why you would think mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive to. It interrupts the role play or the action. Actually, I think it heightens it because it it sort of allows you to to be intense, refresh, and come back. So I could imagine a system which gives you pointers at the beginning. Your scene goes for a while, depending on, on the type of scene, and then there's a moment where you are okay. Where does that is that leading to? What are the consequences? What what is triggered by what is going on? You roll the dice, and then it gives you pointers for what's going to follow. Either you continue the scene because it's a, it's a complex scene or you move on, you got a, a cut and you, that's, you're in a, another place but you deal with the consequences of wh what's happened before. Mm. Yeah. And for, and for me, it takes away GM fiat. And the GM fiat, which is like, you talk until I think it's, it's succeeded. Where I, I like the fact that be like, no, you make, make, you make the roll, it goes back and forth, you add stress. Like, does this actually work? And it's not just me deciding, okay, you've talked enough, so now we can this will happen again it's this well, it's it's like the a curator an editor make sure that the the rhythm uh the all of that I, I, is working long story short i need to play cortex with you so <laughs> that would that would be cool <laughs> anytime well thank you very much uh michael where can people uh find you if you wish to be found uh i am improv gm on twitter and twitch um i have a channel confessions of an improv gm where i put up a lot of the games that i run um i've got some uh gm and player advice things i've done a while back that i need to get back to um that's where you can find me amazing i'll put uh, a lot of that in the description of the episode so people if yep. you're watching this on itunes or on youtube or if you're listening to this when it's released in audio you can find there uh, if you're on YouTube, please remember, I'm terrible at that. I should I should have this thing where I point at somewhere in the screen and there's a button uh, appearing. Mm -hmm. uh, please, people, leave a like, uh, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. Apparently, all those things are very important for a YouTuber, which I'm not really. But, uh, yeah, that would be helpful to be noticed by more tabletop RPG fans, and that's it. Uh, again, Michael, thank you, and uh, hopefully we oh, will meet so again uh, at the table. Uh, I'll be running a game I'm designing on August 10, but the time might be uh, difficult uh, for you uh, in uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and the Gauntlet, Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring. It's very structured, so you should like it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to run this game at Nerd Burger Con as well and at the UK Games Expo, Online Virtuality Expo. So uh, I'd love to have you there and uh, anyone watches this, uh, thank you uh, very much for considering it. Thanks, bye! Thank you so much!